I'm Lauren Gilchrist. I'm a product manager from Pivotal Labs. Hi, I'm Andrea Schneider. I'm a product manager at the IRS. And we're going to talk for about uh, 30 minutes. And uh, hopefully everyone's here for an IRS talk and you're not expecting to see Eric Reese because if you are, you're in the wrong room. Right, Eric so. Reese is over there. <laughs> exactly. We're better. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, we want to talk to you a little bit about our experience and our lessons learned building an MVP in the IRS. Um, and before we started, we wanted to give a shout out to our, my colleague, Linda Joy, who is not in this room somehow. She's in the other room. She's in the other room. <laughs> right. Yeah. She's talking to Eric Reese. Um, she is, uh, she illustrated our, she lovingly illustrated our talk, so we wanted to thank her for that. So thank you. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let's get started. Oops. Okay, so all of this MVP stuff, where did it all start? It all started with a business problem. As many of you probably are aware, the IRS has faced ex extreme budgetary cuts over the last few years. We are definitely not Congress's favorite agency. Uh, that translates into poor customer service for our taxpayers, inability to be able to answer questions because people wait on hold if you've ever had to call the IRS, first I apologize, but second, um, <laughs> that you've probably waited on hold for at least an hour and sometimes your call get answered and sometimes it won't. So we definitely knew we have problems with customer service and wanted to see what we could be doing about the overall customer service and if we could narrow it down to a specific problem that we could look at and do something about. Oh, sorry, very so, sensitive quicker. Uh, so on the phones, we get a lot of questions where people call wanting to know how much money they owe. So I'm going to walk you through a scenario where you've filed your taxes and you can't pay a bill. So what do you do? Oh, just ignore it. The IRS will go away. Uh, what happens is the IRS will send you a letter. Not actually true, by the way. Not actually true. <laughs> the IRS will send you a letter. We won't call you. So if you get calls from someone telling you that you owe the IRS money, it's a scam. Uh, and at the moment, we won't email you. We will send you a letter in the Postal Service. Uh, like most people, when you get mail from the IRS, you panic. You either put it aside and think, ah, they don't really need anything from me, and eventually you'll get around to opening it. Or you open it and freak out, and the first thing you do is you call. In that letter, it tells you, here's your balance, here's how much you owe, and you have this many days to make your payments and to pay it all in full. So people call because they either don't understand why they owe, or they've waited too long and it's now past that day and they don't now know how much they do owe. So when they do call, they have this lovely experience of sitting on hold and hopefully getting in touch with somebody. Uh, just to give you an idea of scope of what we deal with at the IRS, in 2014 we collected $3 trillion in taxes and our phone volume on this one specific topic averages around 200,000 calls per month. So it's a lot of calls to deal with. Uh, and a lot of those calls don't get answered. So it seemed to us that uh, in our constrained budgetary times, the best way we could fix this problem was let's build, it, build some software, see if we can and answer this problem online. However, building software at the IRS is hard, uh, <laughs> as you might imagine. They have, we have all of these little hurdles here. These are the little ones, and I'm going to describe some of the other processes of what happens when you decide inside a federal agency that you want to build something. Uh, first, you identify what your problem is and say, aha, we have, some, we have a solution for this, and we're going to put in a budget request to the Office of Management and Budget for money to come to us in about three years. So that's our first lead time. Once we get approval for that money, <laughs> nothing heads. Like, is this really how it works? <laughs> Welcome to your government. Uh, the business group will spend traditionally in a waterfall process a year or so collecting and gathering and putting together a giant requirements document of here's all the things we want IT to build. Very waterfall, very traditional. Throw it over the fence to IT, who then diligently codes away. Never hear from the business ever again. Once they get through that process and have something that kind of looks like what they think the business wants, we've all heard this story before, show it back to the business customer who says, well, things have kind of changed and I don't really need it to look like that anymore. I need it to look like this. And even after all that development's gone on, 
There's integration testing that has to happen that's waited till the end. Then there's a four month security review that still has to happen. So you're getting the picture that all of these hurdles take a really long time to be able to build software at the IRS. Uh, in addition, once all of those things are done, uh, there's something called an authority to operate. Uh, if anybody went to the 18F presentation yesterday, they talked about a lot of the rules and regulations that need to be followed, and specifically this authority to operate, where someone says, yes, I understand all of the risks of what it's going to be to put this software out there, and I'm going to sign on the dotted line, and when things hit the fan, I'm going to appear in front of Congress and explain what happened. Any of you want that job? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so all right. so we, we have a lot of things that we need to deal with inside the IRS. Uh, compounding that with the volume that we, I talked about in terms of dollars also translates into the number of tax returns we get within a very small window of time. So between January and April, our peak filing season, we process approximately 240 million tax returns. So IT says, halt, we're not doing anything during that time. We've got to run tax processing. So we have a blackout window where we can't release software. So compounding all of the other factors in government, IRS has an additional one of this giant blackout window. Uh, fun fact that Andrew forgot to mention, um, one thing that I learned in working with the IRS is that the IRS is still running a lot of applications that were made during the Kennedy administration. Um, and I think that some of them, and awe. yes, I think some of them actually are uh, still in use to process our tax returns. Yeah, the, the core tax processing systems were written in assembler during the Kennedy administration, and that's what's running your tax systems today. <laughs> Scared yet? <laughs> okay, so we heard about this thing called agile, right? So uh, get away from our traditional waterfall processes. Can agile make our life easier? Um, so, OMB budget requirements, don't think Agile can really help us fix that. Uh, communication between the business organization and the IT group, maybe Agile can help fix that a little bit. Uh, maybe we can actually get to the point where we can build software a little faster if we go with more of a, an Agile approach, this thing we've heard about Agile. Um, but, uh, we know, based on how great we are at Waterfall, that we're probably not going to be all that great at Agile either. So <laughs> clearly said, I think we're going to need some help here. So you know, did the whole phone friend. Uh, how, does, how does this work in the real world, not in government, not in the IRS? What's the commercial space look like, and how are they dealing with it? So that's when we engage with Pivotal Labs. Uh, so Andrew and I have been working together since May. 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 Um, so I work for Pivotal Labs. Uh, Labs is a agile delivery consultancy, um, and we see a lot of organizations like the IRS who turn to agile to help solve problems like this. And what we've learned over the years is that you know agile is a, a software development philosophy and a management philosophy, but it's really this planning and, de and delivery methodology, right, that helps you get a product to market faster and that maybe helps you. Uh, get a product to market with, with fewer errors, and it helps reduce these walls that go up between teams. And maybe that can even shorten some cycle times to get something in the hand of the hands of real users uh, faster. But it's not the silver bullet that everybody kind of seems to think it is. Um, unfortunately, Agile doesn't really make sure that you build the right software. In fact, it can even help you deliver the wrong software faster. Um, so what we realized on this engagement is we really needed to build the right thing, and we needed to have a lot of confidence that we, the software that we were building uh, met the needs of our customers, the American taxpayer. So to compound this problem, uh, I'm going to let Andrew speak to this a little bit, but government in particular really needs to build the right software. Right. So the IRS, just like any other federal government agency, any nonprofit, cannot be cavalier with how we spend our dollars. We take it very seriously and try not to throw good money after bad, building things that people don't need or want. Uh, it's not like a private sector, specifically at the IRS, where people can say, oh yeah, I want my taxes processed by this group instead. We're the only game in town, so we've got to get it right. There's lots of ways that you can get to us through software from other providers, but in the end, the IRS is still the one that's going to process your taxes. And if you're going to get a refund, it's going to come to us, and if you owe money, it's going to come back to us as well. So, Seeing as how all of America is actually paying for what we're putting out there, we really need to make sure that we're going to build the right thing. 
uh, as people pay for this, you want to make sure we're building the right thing, and we want to put the right software out in use for the public. So uh, we've learned through other government experiences, something like you know healthcare.gov, that when you do the wrong thing, people know about it, and um, it doesn't really go very well. So it's always avoiding the healthcare.gov moment. I know that's been used a lot around this conference to talk about things in the private industry, but when it's in the public sector, it's even more important. Explicitly, one of the goals of our kickoff meeting was actually uh, do not be healthcare.gov. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when Pivotal Labs began its engagement with the IRS, uh, we, we really knew we needed to build the right thing, and uh, we started to start thinking about like how do we make sure that we build the right thing. We know it's incredibly crucial that we do this right. Um, and we started to begin to ask if lean could really be the thing that, that helped make sure we could we could do build the right software in the government. Um, and luckily I get to work with uh, Janice Frazier who is uh, our head of innovation at Pivotal and she gave a workshop on Monday uh, for the leader's guide. But Janice also has taught us um, that lean kind of breaks down into these basic concepts and that those can really be applied anywhere. Um, and those are, you know, to list out your assumptions, right, document what you're assuming, um, to understand your customers, know a little bit about who you're, who you're talking about and who you're talking to and who you're building for, and then get something into the world and adjust based on evidence, right, build, measure, learn, as Eric says. So we kicked off this engagement with the IRS, and the first thing that we asked was, what problem are we solving, and how do we know if we're right? And Andrea responded. So we think that taxpayers want to know everything that they can, not just about their balance, but their whole history. So if you do call and get through to somebody, that customer service representative will be able to tell you, oh, here's what your refund was last year, and here's what you paid in taxes year before, and uh, remember when you had that balance and you were in the installment agreement, this is how much you paid every month. So your whole history of everything you ever did or um, experienced with the IRS, a customer service representative can tell you. So even though we thought we were just gonna look at this phone thing and try to make data available online, we thought really we should put everything out there that the taxpayer could want. Was that really the right question? Yeah, we, we sort of start picking this apart along the way, and um, we we started asking these innocent questions of like, is that actually true? Do people really want sort of a digital version of a customer service rep? Um, do they want to know everything possible? And the only way that we can know that for sure is by talking to some actual taxpayers. Um, so if you can imagine, if you this this is basically a, a lot of the reasons that this, the IRS is building this software is to help people understand what they owe. And if you owe money to the IRS, you are not exactly lining up around the block trying to give feedback on the software that the IRS is building. <laughs> Shocker, right? So we had to get kind of creative, um, and we talked to people that had. We actually wound up talking to people who had made a payment to the IRS, and we asked them a lot of questions about what that experience looked like and you know, how they were able to know that that payment went through and when, the, when they made that payment and how they made that payment, was it by check, by credit card, et cetera. Uh, but we didn't actually stop there. We, we actually took some early design prototypes and we put them in front of taxpayers. So I'm one through the photo um, from our space uh, on this engagement and we're putting a, a tax, we're returning, putting a prototype in front of taxpayers and getting feedback. And we asked them to complete some pretty simple tasks uh, such as checking what their balance was and seeing if they were due a refund. And we sweetened the deal with free donuts. And these were, there's a Krispy Kreme down the street from our office, so you can see that's great. Um, so the thing about these is they, this wasn't actually working software, this was a clickable prototype. It was designed to look like the real thing, but it didn't actually work. Um, and what we learned from this was that taxpayers were absolutely overwhelmed by our designs. They were completely overwhelmed by the fact that we were putting all of this account information in front of them, and they didn't actually want to know everything. They wanted to know simply if they owed anything to the IRS, and if they did, what that amount was. Um, and furthermore, they expressed that they have this mental model of thinking about it like a bank statement or a credit card. Um, so that was really helpful, and this is actually an example of some design iterations that we did 
Um, on the left, you'll see that we sort of have everything that we could possibly have wanted in, a, in an online account. You'll see balance due, taxes paid, refund applied. Um, something I learned in working with the IRS is that if you receive a refund, you can actually roll that refund into your taxes for the next year. Uh, so that's what that represents, or no information available. And then on the right, we started to iterate away from that and we moved this more towards what you owe, or you owe nothing, or we can't calculate what you owe because you haven't filed your return. Um, and we also made some other changes that aren't really reflected here that kind of began to iterate this towards looking a little bit more like a bank statement. So by going through this lean cycle of listing our assumptions and talking to real taxpayers and putting a real prototype in front of people, even if it didn't work, um, and then adjusting based on evidence, uh, we were getting more and more confident that we were actually, actually building the right software. And we continue to do this kind of feedback cycle every two to three weeks throughout the course of this engagement. And these feedback loops have given us a lot more confidence that we're on the right track and that we're actually building the right thing. Um, so now we'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about, like, about how you, you can apply um, some lean principles to building software in environments where there are a lot of constraints, like the government or nonprofits. Uh, I think there's a lot of talk in the, there was a lot of, of talk in the earlier lean startup conferences about, you know, how this applies in startups where you're two to three people in someone's living room or in a garage and you're, you can experiment really easily and you have no money so, you know, you can't plan forever. Um, there's not a lot of conversations in our experience about how lean is applied in, a, in large bureaucracies where every single constraint applies. <coughs> Um, so we're, we're looking to share a little bit of our lessons learned and hope that you can take something away from that. Um, so just a high level overview of what we wanted, what we learned um, is testing with real people, uh, using data wisely, and embracing constraints up front. So I'm going to let Andrea talk a little bit about testing with real people. Right. So Lauren talked a little bit about the real people that we wanted to talk to and how difficult that really is. Trying to get to your ultimate user, in this case, a person who owes money to the IRS, is not likely to show up on our doorstep and say, "Yeah, please, can I, how can I sit down at your table and click on your prototype and I'll tell you what I think, but don't ask me for money." Yeah. So we need to. I just want to interrupt there. We do not actually ask collect on anyone no. that we do user testing with. It's been, right. been very hard to remind people of right. that. Right. So or flag anybody like, oh, right. now we know who you are. So, uh, <laughs> so it's, it's, as you can imagine, you know, not the most popular of the federal agencies. So getting people to line up to help us out is a little challenging. So um, on top of that, we have, uh, it's government. And the, there's a thing called the Paperwork Reduction Act, which was put in place to protect taxpayers from having to do too much stuff for government. But in the end, what wound up happening was it put the burden back on government. And you have to fill out, as a, as a federal employee that's looking to try to do user research or a survey, you have to put together a huge package of information to submit to some organization inside the IRS that then submits it to Treasury, then ultimately submits it to the Office of Management and Budget to then put out a statement on a website somewhere where the public can say, yay or nay, we like this idea or we don't like this idea. And if we don't, then it gets shut down. And if no one contributes anything, which is what happens most of the time, then eventually it comes back around to us to say, OK, you can go do your study. Well, that's been 10 months or so. So these short feedback loops can't happen quickly when it takes you 10 months to get approval or a year to get approval to be able to talk to anybody. So fortunately, we have to say, thanks to the effort of folks like h &F and the US Digital Service, uh, the, there have been some changes in this area, and the interpretation of the Paperwork Reduction Act has been modified, so user research has gotten to be a little bit easier. Um, before this, uh, there, you could talk to anybody, if, as long as you talked to less than, or asked at least less than, I guess not at least less than, but um, mm -hmm. 10 people or less that you could ask, what do you think about this? So we were really limited from the beginning of what it was we wanted to do, uh, but we worked around it. So um, in the past, because we knew we had these constraints about talking to larger groups of people, 
when we figured out, well, people work at the IRS, taxpayers too, we'll just talk to IRS employees. So it sounds like a good idea, but ultimately they're not really our end user. <coughs> so another test of real people finding is employees are not a substitute for end users. <laughs> uh, so in the scenario that we talked about where you receive your tax bill and uh, it says that you owe this balance and you have to pay it by this day, an IRS employee knows that if you don't pay it by that day, interest and penalties will accrue on a daily basis, which means that that number can get incrementally larger very quickly. But when we showed our initial prototype to our users, they didn't have any idea why that balance would be different today than it would be two weeks from now. Like, that's what you said I owe, so that's what it would be. So we learned a lot about what IRS people knew versus what the public knew, and some assumptions that we had made when we started with our design versus where we needed to take it. Yeah, fun fact, IRS employees can actually get disciplinary action for not paying their taxes on time or making a mistake in their tax returns. Uh, so they can get fired for not paying their taxes on time. So they are not particularly good, objective people to test with, as it turns out. Right, IRS employees get audited every year. So yet another reason you all want to come work for the IRS. <laughs> very attractive. <laughs> and partnering with testing with the real people was the idea of being able to put something out there as quickly as we could. So test it before you launch and stuff. And even if you can build, test it before you build it, do it. So um, again, along the lines of trying to make sure that we're putting the right software out there, we need to be testing. And testing before we put it into production. So putting something into the real world from a lean principle often means really put it out there. But in our world, it meant, let's put out a prototype. So trying to adapt principles in a way that they can work for what we need to do. So our, you saw the example of a piece of our clickable prototype, and we got to see how users interacted, as opposed to, tell me what you would do here, which is never really what people do, as we all know. They'll tell you one thing, but they'll do something else. So being able to observe behavior is always a better way to go if you can. What your, what your customers do do as opposed to what they say they will do. And surprisingly, as, as much as we've made this unattract sound unattractive to give feedback to the IRS, people were really willing to do it. Uh, we were surprised to hear how many comments we got of what people liked and what people didn't understand and where we could really make improvements and changes. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, using data effectively. Um, so when we started to spin up this engine of regular user feedback, uh, we got a lot of pushback from the IRS that the number of taxpayers that we were talking to and getting feedback from is not statistically significant. And there's a lot of logic behind this, especially when you consider that when the government surveys people for things like um, uh, service level in the IRS, uh, it does, there's a bunch of legislation in place to make sure that those surveys are just and they're broad and they're fair as you would want them to be. Uh, but unfortunately, that kind of legislation also depends on the fact that you have something out there in the public to actually test with people. And we didn't have the luxury of building the wrong thing and then asking people how we did. Um, that meant that we had to get feedback from a much smaller number of people and look for patterns. So when we do usability testing and then when we teach our clients how to do usability testing, or in this case, problem solution fit testing, uh, we learn a lot from the first person that we test with and then we learn a lot from the second person that we test with and sort of by the fourth or fifth person, you, you begin to get diminishing returns. Um, the things that are most salient tend to get repeated over and over again. And usually when you're in these sessions by, you know, by like the fifth one, you're kind of rolling your eyes and you're like, yeah, I know. Um, and there's actually there's a quote from this legendary uh, user research guy named Jared Spool, who says who has this quote that says statistical significance doesn't mean more data, right? It just means that the data that you have can actually predict the outcomes. So by putting prototypes, clickable prototypes, in front of eight people at a time, uh, we were able to see enough patterns to make decisions and gain evidence that we were on the right track and that we were building the right thing. Uh, so definitely, you know, feel free to push back on, you know, this desire to have everything, every decision be statistically significant. And continuing on that point, um, 
I think that one thing that I found a lot is that there was a distinct need to balance sort of quantitative and qualitative evidence. This, this measure thing in the build, measure, learn cycle gets really complicated when you're dealing with the scale of the IRS. Uh, so you, you have to, and then additionally, you have to remember that every IRS employee is a public servant who has taken an oath on a Bible to protect the American taxpayer. So that means it can be incredibly easy as a product and design team to get caught up in edge cases or anecdotal experiences when you're designing something. Um, and for me, it was really important. I think of my role a lot as uh, what Janice would call this, the scales of justice, right? So it was really important to balance both qualitative and quantitative evidence when making these decisions. And I'll, I'll give you two examples. Um, in one scenario, we had decided to leave a feature out of our online account um, that displayed what's called the shared responsibility payment, which is what you owe, the penalty that you pay if you're uninsured. Does anybody know what this is? Under Obamacare. No, okay. Yeah. So it's also had like seven other names, to right. be fair. What was it before? It was the... It, it's got, it has a few names, but ultimately, under the Affordable Care Act, if you don't have proper insurance coverage, the whole reason that the law was upheld was because the IRS could then uh, put a penalty on you for not having insurance. So that's now called the shared responsibility payment. Makes sense to all of us, right? <laughs> well, we, we'll be here all day, right? Um, but we cannot fix your tax problems. So sorry. We should probably have started that talk with this disclaimer, right? We cannot, we actually are legally prohibited from talking about individual taxpayers here. Um, and there are penalties for that too. Anyway, okay, so uh, so we, we're building this feature and we have the shared responsibility payment and people were having a really hard time understanding it. So we got a lot of qualitative evidence that no one really got what this thing was. So we decided to leave it out for MVP. Um, and then maybe a week later, we were digging into the data, which took a while to pull, and we realized that almost 30% of taxpayers are gonna owe this. Uh, is it 2014 or 2014? In 2014, 2014 taxes. taxes. Okay. So that was a scenario where the qualitative evidence definitely made the case to get this back in, in scope for MVP. On the flip side, uh, there was another scenario where we wound up going, spending several design cycles uh, trying to solve for a problem of what you should pay on a date in the future. So if you owe a balance to the IRS, as we've already established, your taxes and your penalties uh, sorry, your penalties and your interest accrues every day. So let's say if you got paid at the end of the month and you were going to make a payment then, you would need to know what that amount was uh, on that future date. And this was a really hard thing to design for, particularly in a mobile responsive website. Um, so we, we, we did a couple design iterations on it, and then as we, and as we dug into the data, we actually learned that only half a percent of balance due phone calls are ever calling about a future date. Uh, so that was, a, that was something where the, the, qua the quantitative evidence told us that we should probably scrap it. Now, granted, that, that half a percent is still a thousand phone calls a month. Uh, so again, thinking about the scale here and the number of people that you're dealing with, it's really, really important to try to balance these qualitative and quantitative pieces. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting is as we started to try to balance these things, we were learning that a lot of people were letting data sort of trip them up around facts and opinion. There were a lot of facts that were really a lot of opinion. Um, and that kind of leads to my last point, which is be a scientist, not an expert. So I gave a talk here last year about how I had gotten really stuck on a project and I was realizing that I was thinking a lot like an expert and that changing my, my mentality and thinking like a scientist sort of gave me this freedom to fail and to be confident in that and to, it, it also helped me help my team uh, sort of lead them to a better outcome and help facilitate them getting to a better outcome. And I found that this mentality was something that really helped and we kind of tried to adopt as a team uh, inside the IRS because we faced a lot of headwinds um, as we were trying to do some of these experiments. So because IRS employees are also taxpayers, right, they're not only the president, they're the member as well, um, they, they use the software that we build and that means that a lot of them are really, really opinionated about what it should do and how it should look. And furthermore, there's a whole government culture around something called a subject matter expert or an SME. 
Uh, we actually have a few of them on our team, and SMEs are incredibly opinionated. <coughs> and not only that, they are paid and rewarded to be opinionated about how things should look and work. Um, so there's a lot of expert mentality in the government, and you know, as we well know with the government, um, strong opinions can lead to stalemates and government shutdowns and you know, lack of action. Uh, so it was really important for us as a team to culturally combat this expert mentality by trying to turn every conversation back to evidence. Um, you know, and well, what about this? Well, how often does that happen? Right? And do we have evidence that that happens? And can we point to the evidence that that happens? Um, and we, we, it also gave us the freedom to say we don't really know what the best experience is for users. And, but that's OK, because we can figure it out by going through these lean cycles and sort of listing our assumptions and understanding customers, putting things in front of people, and iterating. Uh, so I think our advice is when you run into this you know, this very uh, expert mentality that's, that's trying to say, like, no, it's, it needs to be this, you know, try to, try to use evidence to, to make your point and try to think a little bit more like a scientist, and then once you're comfortable doing that, try to inspire other people on your team to do it as well. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, how to embrace your constraints up front. Right. So, uh, clearly, we've talked about all of the constraints that, that exist in a government world. Um, one of them, specifically, is around accessibility. Uh, so earlier in the week, uh, Alistair Kroll spoke at an analytics talk and gave an example about uh, when Amazon first started, uh, they had a, an audience that they knew they were going after, which were readers, and they were launching a website that sold books. And then they iterated on that and created a device on which you could then read those books. But then their third spike in all of that was, wait, we can take books that weren't available to people before, people with low vision or whatnot, and now with this new device, we can make those books available to people who had never been able to get them before. So that's really great for somebody like Amazon, where you could go through those iterations. In government, we've got to get to that third iteration from the beginning. Everything that we build has to be accessible to someone with low vision or someone with a physical impairment that needs to use some sort of device to help them. So we need to be able to build for screen readers from the beginning. We need to be able to build for someone navigating on a keyboard only. Uh, so if you're starting with a mobile first approach, what does that look like? So there's all of these factors that uh, traditionally in IRS have always existed, but kind of get left to the end. Like, oh, we'll retrofit it when we get to the point where we can launch it. And where or, or ask for a waiver to or do ask it for later. a waiver to do it later, which happens unfortunately. Uh, so we decided that if we could pull together our team of product managers and designers and experts in 508 compliance, which is the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, Section 508. Because I'm, you know, I'm a government wonk. I have to know these things. Uh, then. The people that could help us get that advice up front could help us in a design way that we could put something out there from the beginning, from an MVP that's going to be compliant and it's going to work for everybody. So this is a major constraint, but we decided to embrace it from the beginning instead of wait till the end and pretend that we forgot about it or something. So another major constraint that we have to deal with uh, is from a compliance perspective. Uh, we know that because we are spending taxpayer dollars and because we are in an agency where Congress is all over how we spend dollars, uh, TIGDA, the Inspector General for the Tax Administration, will be knocking on our door the second we do something. The Government Accountability Office will be there the next day to look at what we did and why we did it and how we spent the dollars. In addition to that, uh, there are all of those standards that uh, Noah put up there in the ATF talk yesterday um, from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, specifically uh, the special part 800-53, and um, what that looks like from a security perspective. And I think you Noah know, said it was like over 4,000 pages worth of rules and regulations that you have to bake into what you're doing. At ATF, they're tr trying to do this with a cloud-based solution that they're trying to roll out to federal agencies on dying the day the IRS can sign up for this, because then it means that we don't have to worry about the problem anymore. But today, we need to worry about it, and we're doing it up front. So we're trying to embrace 
our security folks to bring them into this process from the beginning. Um, we're still getting there, and it's taking time, but we're acknowledging from the beginning that this is going to be a better way if we can bake in our processes from the beginning. We can do a whole other talk, maybe that'll be next year, about how we're changing our processes to accommodate some of these things. But uh, making sure that, that this is the right way to go. Compliance-driven development. Yeah. Hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> so um, while launching an MVP in the government in two weeks sounds like unicorns and rainbows, we're not there. Uh, we recognize that we have a lot to learn and that we're still we're getting better all the time. Having help from experts like Warren and the team from Pivotal Labs is getting us there step by step. Uh, but it's important for us to remember that our MVP has to be viable not only for our users but for all the federal agency regulators that are going to come in and look for what we're doing and that we're putting the right thing out there, the right that we're building the right software. So we're learning a ton and we are embracing the digital community and government. Uh, I keep alluding to ATF and USDS and the digital gov space, um, trying to be collaborative across government to learn what other agencies are doing and how they're doing it better uh, so that we can get better at what we're doing and, and working towards this concept of a minimum viable product, which are words that had really never been uttered in my agency before the last six months. So. That's a major accomplishment in and of itself. To hear uh, at an executive steering committee last Friday, the head of one of the major business divisions talking about an MVP to the deputy commissioner was kind of enlightening. <laughs> we did that. So. <laughs> uh, so just to recap, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll get into questions. Um, so what, what does lean government look like in our eyes? Um, testing with real people and you know, doing the like work, however, blood, however many blood, sweat, and tears it takes to actually make sure that you can get real people to test with um, and not your employees. Uh, we've actually got a, we have a win on this. We have a vehicle set up where we can actually schedule and pay users uh, to interview with which was a huge hurdle back in May, and it's now operationalized. So that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, using data wisely, right? Being, being the scales of justice, making sure that you're sort of fighting this instinct against um, statistical significance, and that you're also weighing both the anecdotal, like, I don't understand this at all, versus, well, it's only, you know, 1,000 calls a month. Can we get away with that? Um, and also sort of bringing that, that mentality, I think Andrea was a really good uh, sort of bad cop about a lot of these things where we, you know, three members of the team would get stuck on a, like a really hard taxpayer scenario that we had to solve for and she would say, well, how often does it really happen? Um, and then the last piece, embracing constraints up front. Um, I think that the, the Pivotal Labs office in DC has this new hashtag of, of compliance driven development um, because so much of government software development and so much of these constraints are really founded on, uh, on waterfall and you know no one has really taken a hard look at what does it look like if you get you know a security person, a cyber person, a 508 person in the room with the team that's doing product and design and development as well and can, does that mean that you can actually have done done uh, be compliant and accessible and secure. Um, and these are things that, you know, we're still very much in the weeds of working through, and they're very hard, and it's a lot of change for people that are very used to, you know, something gets thrown over the wall to me, I check the box, I throw it over the wall to the next person. Um, so that's, that's mostly our talk, um, and we kind of wanted to wrap up by saying that we, we, this is incredibly, incredibly hard. This is the, you know, from my perspective, this is the, the hardest work that I've ever done. This is the biggest scale that I've ever worked at. Um, but it's so worth it. I think that, you know, we, we came together to speak here because we really want, you know, we don't think there are a lot of examples of lean stories being told in government settings or in large institution settings. and. We wanted to be open and honest, and maybe a little too honest, about you know some of the challenges that we faced it, that we faced here, and in hopes that other people are going to open up a little bit more and try to share their story. Um, we have a saying at Pivotal, inspired by also by Chanis, who says, um, "Try it on Monday." And 
you know, if, if people can walk out of this conference and try something on Monday, particularly in the government, I think that's a huge, huge win and a, and a big success for us. And finally, we, the things that we have learned by embracing lean have saved us probably thousands of hours of development work and, you know, countless taxpayer dollars. Um, and, and we really are a lot more confident that we're building the right thing. I don't think that, you know, it's, it's never perfect, right? As that's the first lesson you learn as a product manager, and it could always be better. Uh, but I think that we're a lot more confident that we are solving some tax, some real tax parities. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize that it's hard and it's it's really rewarding. Right. And keep in mind, if the IRS can do it. <laughs> so don't be afraid, as Lauren said, try it on Monday and share your stories. So. Uh, those were our, our biggest takeaways. So. Um, that's it. Questions? <laughs>